bills, at least half of which is on tour. Guy, you're living the proper racing driver lifestyle this week in a bunker in a, an undisclosed location tonight for a secret test tomorrow. Then you're jetting out to Sebring to get behind the wheel of that United Auto Sports sports car, which looks pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it feels strange, Paul, I have to say, being, uh, being let out the house for good behaviour. Um, it's the first time I've been sort of travelled and since, since probably the mid part of, of last year. So nice to be out the house, nice change of scenery. Um, and as you say, you know, doing some testing tomorrow and then uh, and then head to, to, to America. So looking forward to uh, being back at Sebring. It's been a while since I've raced there and it's been a while since I've raced, to be fair. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. It should be a lot of fun. So that, if anything else, if you're listening to this, I should give you a bit of hope that things are on their way to getting back to normal because Guy Smith is back on a plane and he's racing in America from the weekend. Tonight's guest then is a bit of an enigma because depending on the age of the person you're talking to, they'll remember him first and foremost for a different part of his career. Such was the length and distinction of said career. To the Toka Touring Car generation, that's that's people like me. He's a BTCC driver. To the generation before that, he's probably Mr. Sports Car and go way back and people would know him as that stock car bloke. But, you know, serious question. If a career includes four F1 podiums, should that be the measure by which that career is defined? I think it should be. I am, of course, talking about Mr. Derek Warwick. Welcome to Spinning Wheels. Ah, thank you very much. Enjoying. Now, um, I was having a look at your stock car you. earlier. Sorry? I was looking at your stock car earlier, which is where it all began for you, was it not? And it's, it's quite a bit of kit, I think. Yeah, well, it, uh, you call it stock cars. There were super stocks, F2 super stocks. Yep. Um, it was just something that was naturally uh, for me because my father and uncle raced, um, and I obviously followed in their footsteps and uh, very quickly got the hang of it. And um, it was just something, you know, you could build your own chassis. Uh, my uncle built the engines. Uh, my father paid for the engines um, and I blew the engines up. So um, it was quite a team effort, really. Um, racing against your father and uncle um, on the little quarter mile ovals um, is pretty cool. Uh, it was good racing. It was competitive racing. Um, and to get the most out of two corners, effectively, um, you've got to pretty fine tune the car. And it, it taught me, I think, uh, when I look back now, um, it taught me how to understand how a car works, how um, how you can feel everything from uh, from the from the seat, from your bum, um, and I think that's uh, everybody used to take the Mickey out of uh, Derek Warwick, the stock car driver, but um, I think it it, it it could be in good stead, really. So Derek, the stock car stuff is it is it um, on on pavement or on on uh, shell uh, on on shell? Yeah, is it okay? No, it's both. Um, it's both. Okay. We, we raced at uh, places like Wimbledon that was Shell, White City, Walthamstow that was Tarmac. Yep. Uh, Ringwood was Tarmac. So it was a variation of both. So you had to have different setups on the car yep. uh, for, for um, different tracks. Some tracks was, were a few yards longer than others, so different gearing, um, but always um, uh, anti-clockwise. Yeah, I guess getting used to finding the grip as well and finding out where the grip is and those small margins, it's, 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 there's, you know, there's quite a lot in that, I guess. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you quickly learn how to, how to um, uh, uh, bring Ackerman into the car because mm. uh, you wanted to turn in left hand wheel more than right. And uh, we had different dampers and, um, and then we really got carried away once and, and put Coney's on, uh, which uh, completely transformed the car. Um, but when I look back now, we were novices. I mean, we were, I mean, how we had the success we had, I have no idea, but, um, uh, obviously lucky, a little bit of talent, um, and good engines from my uncle. My uncle used to build good engines actually. And, um, he never held back on, on the horsepower. So, you know, it was, it was, it was strange because, you know, you, you used to come up against each other in the race, uh, uncle, not so quick. Dad was quite quick. Um, but of course, aggressive um, little son was um, was quicker of the three, really. So it was I, I remember looking back now thinking I was absolutely perfect to be a racing driver because I was a, a selfish son of a bitch, you know, because I remember um, coming out of order shot, um, going to uh, the English championships, I think. And my father's engine was much quicker than mine. I mean, he just pulled away from me. I still beat him and won the race but he just pulled away from me we got back from Orish on a thursday night and we worked all night jacked his engine out put it into my car took my car engine out and put it into his i never even gave it a second thought so 
you know, when when you're a selfish racing driver, uh, as you well know, Guy, um, you, you, you do whatever you can to get that extra tenth of a second. I was having to look around and I couldn't find another driver who got to F1 and had started in F2 stocks. They must be quite proud of you in that circle. There were people that talk about you over dinner. They used to race with this F1 driver. Um, did, didn't uh, Brun, uh, Martin Brundle? Didn't did he, he, did come, he start there? He came from ovals. I, I think he did mini stocks or right. um, hot rods or something, but he's, he, he definitely did the, um, the ovals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for, for honest, I get, you know, I get, a lot of people call me and send me messages saying well done during my Formula One career um, to have come from from um, super stocks. Yeah. Stop calling them stock cars. They're not stock cars. Stock <laughs> cars are bangers. You know, they're, yep. they're, they're, we're more sophisticated. So um, <laughs> there you go. So what was that? So from, from from leading on from that then, Derek, so what was the kind of transition to car racing? How did that come about? Um, I was lucky. Um I, obviously, my, my father um, only cared about me, um, cared, cared about the, um, the trailer business, but I had a mad uncle. My uncle Stan was completely mad. You know, he, uh, he flew aerobatic airplanes, he flew helicopters, he wrote off eight brand new Jaguars. He was just a nutter. You know, he was, he was someone that, um, that you, you didn't want to know, but was massive in your uh, upbringing and career. Um, and we won the, the British, the European, and the World Championship um, in Formula Two stock car, uh, super stock, sorry, in super stocks. <laughs> and um, my uh, uncle Stan was flying out of Thruxton, and in '74 um, he was watching a race at Thruxton where Jeff Lees was just um, dominating uh, Formula Ford. And he come back and he said, "Look, boy, we we just got to go and do this Formula Ford stuff. It it looks it looks really cool compared to what we're doing." And it started there, really. Um, that year in 74 was the racing car show. Um, uh, Uncle Stan, myself, um, a few of my mates went up to have a look. Dad wouldn't go. Um, fell in love with them straight away. You know, the, the Hewling gearbox and the, the independent suspension. I mean, it was just, it was just magic. Um, came back, um, tried to persuade Dad to come up and have a look at it. Didn't want to know. Dad wanted me just to run the family business, um, do a bit of stock car racing, get married, have children, um, and um, go and die in the corner somewhere. Um, but Uncle Stan just pushed, push, push, push. And um, between uh, Stan and myself, uh, we created a budget that was completely untrue, um, gave it to Dad. Uh, Dad then came up, because we knew once we got him to the racing car show, he'd fall in love with it. And two days later, he came up there, fell in love with it. And we, we bought a Hawk DL12 off of David Lazenby. And um, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. And, and did, you, did, did you kind of take to it pretty quickly? I mean, was it a big shock moving from the, from the wow. super stocks into, into sort of circuit racing? Well, you mean changing gear and things like that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, you know, and actually turning, turning right as well. Uh, yeah. or, 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 and left. No, I had to turn left as well still, but... Uh, yeah. Oh, it was massive. It really yeah. was. We understood nothing. We didn't know how to understand how to set up the car. Uh, we didn't know how to change the car. Uh, we had a scholar engine that just wasn't good enough to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and we were really struggling. The car wasn't brilliant. Um, and of course, any time that we touched somebody or someone touched us, um, they reverted back to that stock car driver again. So we had a, a sort of an image to get rid of as well. Um, but then um, we started going quite quick at the end of 75 and uh, we bought a uh, Hawk. Well, we didn't buy it actually. It was given to us a Hawk DL, um, DL15 um, and that was magic. I mean, it was, it was easy to set up. Um, we could manage it. Um, I just had my best mates. One was a chippy and the other one was a diesel, diesel engineer. Uh, they were my mechanics. We, we ran off a trailer. Um, and 76 was just brilliant. We won the European Championship. Uh, we were second in, I think, the British, the DJM and something else, uh, Townsend Torreson. Um, won 33 races out of 63 starts or something. So uh, it just clicked. Um, and it was great racing because we had Derek Dane, Daly, Bernard Devaney, um, David Kennedy, Ro um, Rory Bremner, something like that, um, Rod Bremner. Um, all quick drivers. So um, it really, I think it benefited me again, going back to the super stocks, because 
you'd have 30, 40 cars on a quarter mile oval, you know, it kind of got busy, you know, yeah. getting through traffic, round traffic, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, Formula Ford, it, it become natural for me, the racing part. Mm. What was difficult was understanding the technical aspects of the car. Um, we didn't really know. Uh, we didn't know how to set the car up. Uh, we didn't even know how to square the car off. So there was lot, lots of learning, um, all by myself, actually, because my mechanics, even all the way through 75, 76, Formula Ford, 77, 78, um, Formula 3, we ran off a trailer um, out of the back of the garage um, and my mechanics couldn't even change the ratio. So uh, if, we have, if we had a ratio change um, during those years, um, it was me that, that did them. So we, um, you know, we, we did it with the minimum amount of money possible. Um, but, you know, we had success. We got lucky. We picked some right cars. You know, when you, when you pick a right, the, the right car, it, it's, it's halfway there. I really miss miss Formula Ford. I mean, it it, it kind of stopped. Uh, I, I last raced Formula Ford '93, and it kind of stopped not long after that. Um, but you know what a great formula that was. You know, to 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 come into because you could do loads and loads of racing relatively cheaply. And as you say, you could bring a car on a trailer, get your mates to to be mechanics, and you could go and do it. And I mean, I know you obviously work very closely now with you know with the BRDC young drivers and 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 the superstars there. And, you know, I guess when you see kind of how these guys come into motorsport now and, you know, the big budgets and, and, and it's a completely different place, isn't it? To how it was, you know, back in the day, but, um, you know, Formula Ford was, was such a, you know, it's a really sorely missed formula. Cause I think it was, it was such, you know, the festival, things like that were, were kind of, that was all part of motorsport, you know, well, history, well, wasn't it? Festival, we had 250 cars. Yeah. Um, and, and I think what was good is you could go testing. There was no restriction on testing. So you learn how, to drive in the wet, in the dry, um, yeah. and it, it, it not just on a simulator, you know, real life, you know, when yeah. the wind changed and um, everything else. So it was a great training ground, um, and for sure, it was great racing. Um, I I think I learned more in those early years of Formula Ford, um, and when you look at it, you know, even in Formula Three in '78 when we won the Van der Waal and won 12 races. <laughs> Uh, in Formula 3 against PK and C uh, Chico Serra, De uh, Chesers and people like that. At the end of that year, we spent less than £20,000. So okay. you could still get your friends, your mates to put a few quid in um, in order to finish the season because um, we were really struggling financially. Um, whereas now, I don't know, um, Formula 4 um, in the UK is something like about two hundred and fifty grand. Yeah. Um, Formula Three, um, which is um, a great formula to do, British Formula Three, I think is about three hundred. You start going FIA. I mean, you know, you're Crazy. talking Formula Four. If you sign for um, Prema, um, you have to do the Italian and uh, German Championship, plus commit to forty days of testing. It's one point two million. That's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's just four. crazy. You know, yeah. So obviously there's cheaper ways of doing yeah. it. Um, but, um, you know, it's just, the, the money's very really ridiculous. Formula 3 now, you know, if you haven't got a million plus, you can't do it. Hmm. Um, and Formula 2, probably a million and a half if you want to drive for ART or Prema. So I just, I just have no idea how these young drivers find it. the money. And if we're not careful... Yep. We're going to end up with a lot of rich kids um, being able to do it, and they're going to be our next superstars. And yeah. that's kind of sad, really. And we're seeing a lot of young drivers now, kind of uh, quite early on, abandoning that single seater dream and kind of, you know, like again, before we, we talked to be Formula Ford, it may be something like Formula Renault and Formula Vauxhall, Formula Three. And Formula Three was like, that was the real kind of talent pool of you really kind of knew who was who because you had Macau and all the all the domestic championships and it was always you could always tell who was you know who was the sort of rising stars whereas now it's very difficult but you see a lot of young drivers they they almost they almost get to the point where they do Formula 4 maybe Formula 3 but then they kind of they bail and say right you know the, the money from there onward is as you said is such a big step up that the only option then is maybe to go towards sports car racing, which also now is becoming flooded because everybody goes in that direction. But it's something that it's something that needs some, um, you know, needs some thought going forward. Um, and also, everybody's in such a rush now because unless you're sort of 17 and on, on a Formula One program, you're kind of done. You know, it's, you know, it's great that Max Verstappen and people like that are going into Formula One at a young age, but 
unfortunately, it's making it's just making you know it more and more difficult. And we're, we're even seeing it now. Um, we're going slightly off topic, I know, but I've seen it even in now in, in karting. Um, you know, when when we when we'd all do karting, you do it till you got to seventeen. You'd have a great career in karting, learn a lot. Um, once you got to your car license, you could then move into Formula Ford. Whereas we're seeing now with Ginetta Junior, which is I have to say is a fantastic formula, um, but what it's doing is it's robbing people, it's robbing those karting um, years because the kids are coming out at the age of 13, 14, going into car racing. So they're not really getting the full length of their karting career. You know, um, they 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 as soon as they get to yeah 13, 14, they're in, into cars. So it, it everything's been compressed and and and, and moved down. Um, and, and I just think, think about the Derek's story there, you know, from where you were talking there, Derek, another six years and you were in Formula One. I mean, six years now is, is a massive, expansive like, career, like, isn't it? Like Guy just said, you know, you've missed it in, in six years, yeah. you know, you're 22, 24 um, and you're too old you know, to even think about it, you know, so it is too young. Um, and I just think that, you know, the whole way that the FIA has, has got this staircase of, of talent of cars, if you like, is made uh, motor racing too expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, at least at least when when you had Formula Renault, I know we still got Formula Renault, but you know we had Vauxhall um, back in the day and Renault. I'm sure you, you may have done it, Guy. Yeah. Um, it was affordable by us all, and and you could actually still see the talent. I think one thing I I have seen uh, with the young drivers is the drivers that have come through Formula Four, um, Formula Three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they are better prepared in many ways to then become a professional race driver. Of course, they can't all be Formula One racing drivers, but they get um, a certain feel, talent um, in order to compete. If you compete in a single seater, it does put you in good stead to be a professional racing driver. Not necessarily a Grand Prix driver, but a professional race driver. Why is that? Just for, for the non, you two are professional racing drivers, but I'm here to, to bring that back down to our listeners. I'll be listening thinking, why is that? Um, what is it about single seaters that makes you... You, uh, you, learn, you learn your craft at the end of the day. If you're doing all these different formulas, I think, like Derek said, if you do two or three years of Formula Ford, and then you do two or three years of Formula 3, you're learning your craft while it's relatively cheap. So the pressure's not on, but you're learning your craft. Now everybody's in such a hurry that, you know, half these kids can't heel and toe. They don't know how to change gear properly because it's all paddle shift. So a lot of these basics, you know, they, they're kind of shortcutting. And I think you see a lot of young drivers, they get to seven, well, 18, 19, and they're kind of washed up. You know, they, they haven't made it to Formula 1. They've spent all the money. Career's over. Whereas if you look probably back you know maybe 10 15 years you look look at Derek's career look how long his career was mm. um you know i've been fortunate to have a long career because you don't burn out and also you learn how to yeah. um not prolong your career but it's, it's a business at the end of the day you go racing for a business obviously you want to be a formula one driver or the best that you can be but ultimately it's a business you get into the business because you love driving so to give that up at 20 21 seems a real shame if you can make that last till you're 30 or 40 or, or whatever that may be then then that, that surely that's that's you know that's a great opportunity isn't it um and and too many drivers now they just burn out run out of money and and give you up. also guy you also see these drivers they get dejected because they've they've had this dream um since the age of um eight years of age in bambino um to be a grand prix driver and follow the route of lewis hamilton and we all know that you know they're they're, they're they come along every 10, 12, uh, 20 years. Um, so, you know, people are moving them too fast. I know a, a couple of people that have come to me and said, right, okay, um, we're moving up to um, uh, to Ginetta, but while we're doing Ginetta, we want to be testing Formula 4. And while they're racing the next year in Formula 4, they're already testing Formula 3. Uh, Lando's a very good example. He was already testing one year ahead of himself. So they get so much more experience. Um, when these guys now, they come in, they've got more experience in a simulator um, than they have in the wet. Um, because nine times out of 10, they don't run in the wet because it's too expensive. They're not learning half the races are in the dry anyway, or most of the races. Um, I think it's really difficult for, if I, I've got two grand, I've got three grandsons, two of which uh, race carts, one in Bambino and one just come up to cadets. And I'm already seeing that if you're not careful, you can throw silly money at. When when um, my eldest grandson first done Bambino, we were offered engines at seven and a half thousand pounds 
and fifteen thousand pounds for an eight-year-old well to do Bambino. I mean, it's just crazy. It really is. Fifteen thousand um, pounds for yeah. a Bambino. But that's where money's got carried away, you know. And you've got. I keep. I don't like to keep mentioning Lando because he he, he means so much to me because he's such a, a a great great kid. But you've got parents that are so wealthy, they buy twenty-five engines, dyno twenty-five engines, keep three, mm. and throw back um, the rest into the pool. Um, whereas back in, in my day and maybe even guys day, um, you had one engine, um, and you looked after that engine, you know, you took the head off, um, after every race and lapped the valves in and, and built it back up and off you went testing. Um, it's just different. Um, and, but unless we all move on, um, we're going to fall behind. So, um, I like to think that I try and move on with, with the era that we're in. Um, and have to accept that that's what we've got, yep. you know, don't, mm. don't keep looking back. Mm. And I think that's the strength I've had as I, I've never looked back. You know, I, I, I have no idea half the time what success I had in my career because I don't look back. You know, if I, if I need to understand what I did in 78 or um, 81 or 84 or 87, um, I ring a mate of mine and he tells me what happened, you know, but that's just the way I am, I suppose. Well, well we can tell you, Derek, because I've got it all written <laughs> down here. So, and that's, that's what, you know, that's what we want to talk about, actually. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you've had you know, such an amazing career. I mean, you know, I mean, Formula One, I mean, sports cars, Le Mans wins, you know, World Sports Car Championship, you know, I mean, it, it goes on and, and, and not to mention all the great work you've done with the BRDC. So, um, I mean, you've just, you've, 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 you know, absolutely just had an amazing career. I mean, obviously, um, Formula, th Formula, Formula Ford, moving on to Formula 3, um, uh, British Formula 3 champion, 78? Yeah. Yeah, 17. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, amazing, you know, amazing achievement. So, really, from there, was that kind of the, the springboard into Formula 1 then, after you winning know, that? You know, when I got into Formula Ford, I never had any um, ambitions to be a Grand Prix driver. You know, it was in, in 76, um, it was a great year when... Um, James won the world championship in, in, um, in Japan. Um, and, that, and all of a sudden you thought, well, well this, this would be cool to be able to do that. Um, and then, uh, like I say, we ran out of money in, in, um, in 78. We tried to put a, a deal together with Les Thacker at BP for 79. Bought the wrong car. We bought a 792 March, uh, which was basically a shit box. And, um, and our career almost died. Um, and then um, we were out, out of motor racing. We'd have been uh, dead and buried. Um, but um, Les Thacker from BP um, decided that um, he wanted to put a British team together, um, came to me and said, right, OK, if we were to put a team together, who was it? Who would it be, rather? I said, Tolman. You know, it had to be Tolman. Um, so we had a meeting with Alex Hawkridge and um, put, um, put the Tolman deal together for 1980. And it was only the end of 78 that I really believed that I could be a Grand Prix driver, mm. you know, because when you're, when you're beating uh, Nelson Piquet and Chico Sierra and people like that, then all of a sudden you're one of the top guys. And, and that's a great feeling for confidence and everything. Um, and, and then um, you just have to just keep pushing. Um, and, and I have to say, I've been lucky all my life. We haven't had uh, big finances, but we've made some right decisions going with Tolman, um, although 81 in Formula One was a disaster, um, it was the right move. And uh, I just, I just, you know, you're either lucky in life or you're not. And um, touch wood, um, I've been lucky, I suppose. I what think was that like, stepping up at that point into a Formula One car? And as you say, the stardom was just bigger than ever being after James winning in 76. So everyone, you know, knew about British Formula One drivers and household names. It must have been just heady days um formula two was heady days because all of a sudden i was in a works team um it's the first time the car had taken that been taken out of my control if you like so that was difficult to get used to um yeah. i had one of the the best teachers you can have um if you really wanted to be an arsehole in this sport um and that was brian henton um he, he won't mind me saying that because um we spoke about it many times but he taught me a lot. He taught me how to be hard. He taught me how to be devious. Um, he taught me um, really the, the life of being a racing driver because everybody thinks it's easy. Um, but like Guy said earlier on, you know, it is, has, it does become a business. 
um, and the first person you've got to beat is your teammate. So um, I think I learned that very early from Brian. Um, and then getting into Formula One, I mean, it was just a dream. You know, you, you, I, you, you just can't imagine that this guy from Orsford, who, who, who's a welder, um, got into Formula One. It was just magic. It was just unbelievable. But I think um, several things. First of all, I'm massively competitive. I've been all my life. But I was clever enough to um, try and understand why the great drivers win, why the great drivers always pick the, the right cars. Not that I did, of course, but um, and I followed people like Jackie Stewart and what he was doing in his career and how he did it. I followed Nicky Lauder. You know, the fact that he had Vili Dungle uh, looking after him physically, uh, mentally. Um, and even when in Formula One in, um, in 81, um, I had a Dungle guy working with me. And remember, I, that year I only earned um, 36,000 pounds. So from 36,000 pounds, I had to travel everywhere um, um, and get also this um, nutritionist and, and um, trainer. So I think the reason I'm telling you that story is because I think that put me in really good stead for the rest of my career because I was always fitter than most. I was always stronger than most mentally and physically. Um, and, you know, those cars were not easy to drive um, in the in the early 80s. You know, we didn't have power steering, power brakes and um, uh, um, uh, paddle shift. You know, we it was it was hard work. You know, when you got out of a car um, after Monaco, after four and a half, five thousand gear changes, you know, your gloves was was at a hole in them. And I don't want to overstate it. Um, but it was bloody hard work, you know, and, and, and in order to, to finish a race, you, you really had to be uh, tough and strong. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, so you were Tillman for, from 81 to, um, sorry, you were Tillman from 81 to 83 and then uh, you moved to Renault in 84. Is that, that? Well, I mean, I was still earning peanuts in 83 yeah. uh, with, with Tillman because we just didn't have the sponsors. Yeah. Um, but, lucky enough that the car started to come together the 83 car that that Senna went on to drive in 84 was a magic car it really was um and he never thanked me for setting that car up for him but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later on um but seriously though um the 83 car was good uh we finished in the points only driver to finish in the points in the last four races um and all of a sudden we got interest from from Renault I mean it was just it was ridiculous you know and and we started talking um, and obviously they're used to paying big money because they had Prost and Arnu and people like that before me. Their opening bid was just telephone numbers. And I remember negotiating with them and I was shocked, but I've always been a good uh, poker player. So uh, we, we managed to just push it up a little bit more. And I was at the, um, um, just the car show in London again, uh, the end of 83, when I was negotiating with LaRousse of Renault, uh, when my father called me and said, you're going to have to sit down. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, what's going on? Um, and we um, we did the deal. And um, it was just amazing. And then when you join a team like Renault, you know, with a thousand people, whatever it is, you then feel not necessarily the responsibility, but the joy of... Um, of driving for such a big team, for such a um, a, a great mark, a, a manufacturer that that are used to winning Grand Prix, mm. um, and um, obviously being teammates with Patrick Tambe was a pleasure. I mean, the guy was super fast. Um, he was a gentleman, um, and again, a bit like um, uh, uh, Brian Henton, but on the opposite side, um, he really taught me how to how to live. The Frenchman taught me how to live. And how was it being in a French team? An Englishman in the French team was, did you, did you manage? Was that okay? Or? Uh, yeah. Cause I got it sorted. Cause although yep. there was a, a thousand French people in there, um, they all had to speak English. Otherwise we couldn't communicate. So yep. it used to really uh, piss off uh, Patrick Tambay because he said, you, we've got one Englishman in the team and we all have to speak English. <laughs> a little bit difficult guy, to be honest. Um, you, it does get lost in translation a little bit. Yeah. Um, the way they work is totally different. It took me a while, I think, to get them to focus on um, 
to focus on uh, on the, uh, the negatives and the bad points of the car. When you race for these big manufacturers, you get used to everybody being super important, whether you're the gearbox man, the chassis man, suspension, aero, whatever. They all want their, their, their say in um, what's most important. And the, the French and, I, and, and probably the Italians, i.e. Ferrari to a certain extent, they haven't, they, they haven't learned how to do it step by step by step, you know, like, like we have learned to do over the years. And, you know, you look at what um, Ross Braun did to Ferrari, you know, nobody else would have done that other than the somebody that's used to the, the way that the British teams work. Yeah. So I tried to do that in 84. Um, uh, but um, the car was too, just too unreliable. It had too much power. Um, the, the, it kept on breaking gearboxes, blowing turbos. So we, you know, we, we finished on the side of the track rather um, across the finish line um, quite often. Um, and then the middle of 84, LaRousse came to me and said, um, I want you to sign for 85 because I only had a one year contract. And I spoke to all the people that, that, that um, helped me in, in make decisions, if you like. And, um, and I resigned. I was talking a little bit to Ferrari, but not much. Um, definitely talking to Williams mm. um, for the 85 season. Um, but it just seemed that it was right to stay with the manufacturer. Um, at that time, the Honda wasn't going particularly well with Rosberg. Um, and I decided not to. And of course, the rest is history. Uh, Nigel signed for, um, for Williams and went on and won Grand Prix. So, um, but, you know, do I regret it? No. You know, I, it, at the time, it was the right decision. Yeah. Um, and um, I even today, I wouldn't have changed that decision. Yes, with hindsight, sure. But unfortunately, I wasn't given that when I was born. But we need to um, bring a question in there, guys, because we've had quite a few questions, Derek. So what we tend to do when we've got as many as we've had for you, people like you, is we drop them in as they, they seem a bit more relevant. So there was a particular one from Charlie 1985. And he says this is on Instagram. Um, it's a bit later on, but he's talking about when you almost won, there was the Canadian Grand Prix, I think, but he's talking about the Brazilian Grand Prix. And he, he talks about, do you have any regrets about Grand Prix that you nearly won when other people were jumping in cars that you'd been in and, and going and winning them? So I, I guess that's kind of a, a, a fitting point to drop that question in there. I think um, if you'd have been anywhere near me, um, those days when the gearbox broke, the turbo broke, when I was leading a race, like in Brazil and places like that, Canada, um, you would definitely not want to be anywhere near me. Do I regret it now? Um, do I l lose sleep over it? Absolutely not. You know, that yeah. it was the way that history unfolded itself. Um, I was very, very good, like I said earlier on, at not looking back. Um, yeah. I only look forward. So, you know, if I miss this race because uh, of a, a, um, a mechanical problem, then I'd win the next one. And that's that took me all the way through my career. Um, so no, I don't. I don't have any regrets um, of my whole career. You know, I think I've made some mistakes. Of course, I made mistakes. All drivers make mistakes. Um, but I would be more angry myself when I made a mistake than than a mechanical failure. So um, I could pick myself up very quickly. That's a Good strong stuff. answer. Um, there was a there's a question which um, came up as well in Formula One at that point. I can't remember who asked this. I think it was John Evans actually on Facebook. There were some huge color schemes, you know, liveries and sponsors that, you know, we all just remember today. And nowadays you, you struggle with a modern Formula One car to remember some of the, the sponsors and the liveries. Um, but then you went on to some of the big liveries in sports cars as well. In those days, when you were wearing these, these iconic colors and race suits and iconic liveries on your cars, were there any that really stood out to you that today you think, yeah, I'm really pleased that I... I was in that car because that that's a color scheme that's a car that's a an iconic design that people remember i mean the yeah. silk jaguar is the obvious one yeah i mean i think i think renault stands out with me 84 renault was a great chassis a great car i thought it looked amazing yeah. i thought i looked amazing in the mobiles <laughs> um, at the time um but seriously uh xjr 14 um uh, silk cut uh 91 um amazing i think uh i think the color scheme that was pretty big color wasn't it 
Oh, it's just, it's just brilliant, you know, all the time. Just And the car, you know, it was a Ross Braun car, was just the most amazing car to drive. It had so much grip. Um, so, yeah, probably probably 91 um, Silcut Jaguar. I'm pleased you said it because that's the car that we wheeled into the virtual studio guy. <laughs> that's a good, good shout then, Paul. Good, good shout. <laughs> So it's at what point when you were for, racing Formula One, Derek, did you think, because you hear I, doing this, I hear drivers that have been at the top of the sport saying, look, the bubble bursts at some point and you've got to have an exit plan if you want to stay in motor racing. You can't just think this will go on for as long as I can make it go on for. At what point were you thinking, I must have something else here to fall back on? Or did it not happen like that? Did... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I finished Formula One when I was 38, 39. Um, I knew it was the right time to stop. Um, I already had three years of sports car racing yep. um, with Jaguar in 86 um, after I got bummed out by, by Senna. Um, and then obviously 91 was my choice to go to, um, to Jaguar um, because 90 was a disaster with Lotus. Um, I already had several businesses going. Um, I had six garages at the time, dealerships. Um, we had some residential property that we were developing. Um, so I already had this going on. But the, the other thing I had, which was really good, was I had proper people running it. You know, I let them take the strain, the stress and the aggro. Um, and I just took the glory. So um, like all racing drivers, you know, we like the glory and not the hard work sometimes. Um, so, yeah, no, I had many uh, business interests um, during the end of my career, knowing full well that, that it was going to come to an end. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm still got it now, you know, I still got garages. I've still got, um, residential property I develop. Um, I've, I've moved 13 times in the last 30 years, um, here in Jersey, um, doing houses up. Um, it's a bit of a passion of mine to be fair. Fantastic. So we mentioned there about the center and I've got in my notes. So let's, let's go all the way back to the, um, 85 season obviously you were you were looking to go to Lotus in 86 um and you know the famous story where Senna refused to have you as a teammate because he wanted a pure number two is that is that is that how it stands is that is that the story yeah 100 um yeah. I'd had a contract um negotiated a contract um throughout 85 um was going to be teammate to Senna equal number one um opposite call on the on the spare car um, got called to Lotus um, December 85 um, and they tore the contract up in front of me um, because they hadn't signed their bit, but I'd signed mine, agreed everything. Um, and if I remember rightly, um, also had a deposit um, in the account, which I can assure you they didn't get back. Um, and um, so they tore the contract up um, because Senna said um, that the, the team couldn't run two number one cars. Um, he wanted... He put a lot of pressure on the sponsor. Sponsor came back to Lotus and said, look, we, we're backing Ayrton. Uh, we know you're a British team. We know you want Warwick, but um, we want a number two in that car. Um, they went off and got um, a number two. Um, but of course, that left me with nothing. Um, so I started in 86 without a drive because uh, everything had gone. Um, so I went and did a few sports car races. I went to Daytona and raced a 956 um, and then signed for Jaguar um for um for um uh for 86 sorry not 96 86 um and that was it then um i thought maybe my formula one career had finished um and then the saddest one of the saddest days of my life was uh hearing that elio was killed um at rickard with brabham mm -hmm. um and um i waited and waited didn't know what to do um thought about ringing bernie um but, you know, now with hindsight, it was right. I didn't, we didn't make contact for about 10 days after the accident. And uh, Bernie rang me up and said, um, I'd like you to drive for me. Sent a plane over, um, came back. And let me tell you, negotiating with Bernie Eccleston is not the easiest thing in the world, I can assure you. <laughs> um, I thought it was the right move. Um, it was big, big boots to fill. Um, Elio is, was such a well-loved person within the team. The team needed picking up. Um, I thought I could help to do that. Um, I also thought that although the car was not very good uh, with Gordon Murray in the wings, um, it would come good, but it, it was not really good. But let me tell you, with 1,300 plus horsepower, 
it was a rocket ship. It was, you just could not change gear quick enough. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but for sure, um, Senna kicked, kicked my career into touch a little bit because I never really regained the momentum I had at that time. Um, and, uh, and he, I, I always remember, um, he sent me a new year's card, um, that year, um, wishing me all the best for 86, not realizing that I would be without a drive, not realizing that he'd screwed my career up. Um, but I think what that proved to me is, is to be a legend of this sport. And I don't use the word very often, um, but Ayrton for sure is a legend of our sport. As selfish as I've been in my career, I think people like that just take it to another level. Um, and it, it really is win at all costs. Um, and, um, and it would have been nice to have been his teammate, um, but um, it didn't happen. Um, so you don't look back and you move on. Yeah. To, to, not many people can go away from Formula One and just look at the people who've done it in, in recent years, you know, to come back and still be in a position where you can win. And, you know, those two moments we spoke about, Canada, where Senna ended up retiring, you probably would have won that race if it hadn't been for the failure. And, and then Brazil, that was after you'd come back. Yeah, well, I mean, Arrows was a good, good team. You know, they were a good middle grid team. Uh, you could get lucky now and again, uh, which you can't nowadays. I mean, unless you're in the yeah. top three teams, you know, you've got no chance of winning. But in them days, you know, if it was wet, like in Canada, you know, I, I've always been pretty good in the wet. Um, it gave you an opportunity. In, in, in 89, again, it was a Ross Bourne car. Um, it was just a beautiful car. It was a little nimble car. We put it on the third row at Monaco, um, but we didn't have the money. Jackie didn't quite have enough uh, funds to to put enough back into the car. Um, otherwise, I think we could have won races that year. That's how good the car was. Um, but, you know, then, you know, my career was starting to fizzle out. Um, and then uh, I got a call from Lotus again, um, and I joined them um, for 1990 uh, with Camel on the side. Now that was an iconic livery. Yeah, another iconic yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, actually. Yeah, that. you're right. Yeah, shit car, but nice <laughs> all the good liveries were things that we're not allowed to run anymore. <laughs> Bad things. <laughs> was that that was that the Lam that was the Lamborghini engine, wasn't it's it? V12, wasn't it? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That was the best sounding engine. I mean, it used to rev to fourteen thousand revs. It was ear bursting. It was just beautiful. It really was. It seems strange to think of a British manufacturer with a Lamborghini engine now, doesn't it? When you think of yeah, I know, I know. Were you still doing sports cars at this time, then, Derek? Were you still kind of doing both, or you were you kind of just? No, not really. No. Um, not for ninety, I wasn't. No, I mean, I did, I did a couple of races in '83 back when I was driving for Tolman. Um, I I drove a Jay David car with John Fitzpatrick and one at Brands, um, and drove the Boss car at Spa. So I love driving sports cars, I'll be honest with you, mm. you know, and um, and that's why 86, I just love, love doing it. Not so much pressure. Um, and, you know, I've won a lot of races in sports cars in 86, 91, 92. Um, and people said, oh, you know, why did you win in sports cars and not Formula One? Easy. I had the best car. You know, I had one of the best cars out there um, and you win races and Guy will agree with me when I say uh, winning's easy, um, but when you qualify at the back of the grid, um, keep the motivation um, and and uh, come through. They're the difficult days. They really are. Yeah, yeah. So it, you didn't have just one um, sabbatical and then return to Formula One. You had two because you went away again and, and you came back again. With was that that was footwork, wasn't it, in the nineties? Yeah, um, obviously ninety one uh, was good. I was very disappointed not to win the world championship that year because we got stripped of uh, our points at Silverstone um, because that was you know the year of of my little brother and yeah. I wanted to do something um, to remember him by. Mm. Um, so losing the world championship in ninety one uh, was was tough for me. Um, but of course, I'd already spoken to Jean, uh, Jean Top um, at Peugeot um, and um, went to Peugeot. And there's another good case. You know, um, the first test was at Ricard and uh, we drove that car for like 36 hours until it broke. And then when it broke, uh, we all had a debrief. And I went into this um, like marquee, really, where there was probably 40 people. 
the chassis guy, the gearbox guy, the aero guy, the tire guy, all wanting to talk at the same time. And after about an hour of this, I stood up and I looked at Jean and I said, Jean, this is not going to work and walked and stormed out. And he came to me later on and he said, what's the problem? I said, the problem is everybody's trying to say things and we're not achieving anything. I said, you know, and then I went back to the British team and this, that, and the other. He said, okay, how should we have it then? He said, well, the next debrief, you have the drivers, you have the engineer, and you if you want to. And the very next um, debrief, that's what we had. And when we had a problem with the engine, we brought the engine man in. When we had a problem yeah. with the gearbox, we brought the gearbox man in. Um, and that's how we really won the World Championship that year and Le Mans, um, by all knuckling down and doing a lot of hard work, a lot of miles, a lot of testing. Um, and, um, you know, it paid off. We won the World Championship and, and won Le Mans, which was nice for me um, to sort of remember. I, I, I wanted something big um, still to remember Paul by. And um, I did a lot. I did a lot on that team to to win the championship and and win Le Mans. And with uh, 40 minutes to go, um, we we raced hard for 23 hours. 23 hours, we were flat out against the sister of Peugeot um, and the Toyota. They both broke with about an hour and a quarter to go, so we could sort of lay back a bit. Uh, Dalmas was in the car at the time. Jean brought Dalmas in with half an hour to go. Uh, to put new boots on it um, and uh, a splash of fuel and put me in because he knew that um, I wanted to win that race. And I thought, you know, for Jean to do that, um, French team, French driver at Le Mans, um, to take him out and put me in, um, it's something I will, I will never forget. And it means a lot to me and to Jean. So that, that last stint at Le Mans, you, you, you listen to every gear change, every engine note, because you're thinking it could only go wrong. Mate, that car was knackered. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like you just said, there was so many noises coming from that car. I wish I was. I, I wish I didn't do that last 40 minutes, I tell you. <laughs> I, I would have left that to Yannick any day. Uh, like you say, it's then that you, when you're half throttle and you're just sort of cruising, uh, all those noises come beating into you. <laughs> Brilliant. So... Um... Just yeah, I mean, so then obviously you, um, we've got to talk about British touring cars. I mean, we've had it, we've had um, no, 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 let me no? stop you now. Okay, I do not talk about British touring cars. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Go on, I think, on, I think we should start with the question actually because uh, it was a nice question that will take us into that nicely, which was from Macy Hamera on Instagram. Okay. Uh, and he said, How did you come to set up the triple eight team? And apparently it was a bit of a rush to get it all set up. And then the third part of that question is, how on earth did you end up in the car? <laughs> well, it's funny because um, in 94, um, <clears throat> Tarquini had some quirky rear wing um, yes. and dominated the championship. The one that was in the boot of the car in the dealership. Yeah, so you exactly, just put on yourself yeah. as you left, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, amazing, that. Um, so um, David Richards, who was running the, the Alpha, um, contacted me and I thought, why not? Why not go and win the British Championship, uh, British Touring Car Championship? And of and course, there was, there was massive budgets as well, Derek, because oh, they were paying a fortune, weren't they? I know back mate. then. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I mean, can imagine Formula One driver comes into touring cars. I'm, I'm sure you were like, right then, here we go. <laughs> oh, here we go. I thought, bloody hell, these drivers are earning this kind of money, are they? Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah, 95 wasn't very good. Um, it was me and Simone, and they, they dropped Simone after a while to bring Tarquini back in, so they thought, that it was me and Simone, but um, Tarquini, you know, he didn't do any better than I was doing. So, um, but I didn't like it. You know, uh, at that time, we had a few money problems in the business and I was working 10, 12 hours a day um, and then turning up on a Friday night, expecting to compete with the likes of Alain Manu, um, uh, Cleland, uh, all those, Rydell, all those sort of guys. Mm. They were professional race drivers. You know, that every one of them is good enough to be in, in Formula One if their career had turned left instead of right. So um, it was wishful thinking. Um, and, um, you know, I, I sort of regret a little bit um, doing it in the first place. But it brought me into um, put my own team together. Um, we knew that um, Voxel wasn't happy with Ray Malek. Um, and I got in touch with um, John Nicholson. Um, we met secretly in a lay-by, um, well, actually, no, in, in the Hilton, uh, the end of the M4 um, by Oxford there. 
And um, we did the deal. We shook hands on it right there and then. We put a super team together, my words, not his, uh, with John Gentry, um, uh, Roland Dane, who's a really good friend of mine, obviously myself um, and, um, and people like that. And th to be honest, the, the team was good. I mean, we yeah. put good foundations in, uh, brought a factory um, near Silverstone um and um the rest is history um i wanted to drive the car be honest with you um with cleland um in the first year we thought it was good was going to lose nothing really because um all the good drivers um had already been signed um so it was good to wait a year um and um got lucky at uh, uh knock hill on, on, on a race um so that was good enough for me. Um, and then we brought Alan Menu and Jason Plato and, um, and I ended up running the team. Um, and anybody that knows Jason Plato will know that he is not, and I repeat, not the easiest person to be um, the manager of. I tell you, he is. He is an animal. He really is an animal. Yeah, well, we, we have. And we, also we, a good friend. We, we had him on the podcast, and I was his teammate in Formula Renault, so I know I know him well, and I know I know that he's. I know you 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 work with him a lot now with the BRDC, but great, yeah, great great guy. But yeah, he's an, he's definitely an animal. He is an animal. <laughs> um, any more questions there, Paul? From um... yeah, I'm just scanning down them now. Um, there's a guy called Jamie who does another podcast called Just Cars. Apparently, he's had you on his podcast. And he said to ask you what was the most memorable rule-breaking incident that you witnessed. Because you've been quite well-known for the rules um, and for safety and things over the years. Um, and apparently, that is a good question to ask you. You mean um, while I was racing or? I don't know. Race? It's a question on Instagram. It doesn't go into any more detail. It just says, ask Derek what's the 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 biggest, most shocking break of the rules that he's willing to tell you about. It there suggests that there are a few that you're not willing to tell but, us about. There's a few Jaguar there stories. <laughs> no, there is none. No, I'll, let, I'll let Guy answer that one rather than incriminate myself. No, I, will, I, you know, I, I can honestly say um, that as a driver, I never knowingly cheated. Ever, ever, ever. I'm sure uh, the Tom Walkinshaw Jaguars might have been a little bit tweaky now and again, because he had a bit of a rep for doing that. But I never knowingly knew that we were running underweight or big engine or whatever. A lot of rumours, but um, never, as far as I'm concerned, um, truthful. I remember, I remember Martin uh, saying, then, telling some stories about about driving driving two cars in the same race and you know changing over in in, in pit stops. Whether that's true or not, I've no idea. But it's it's great it's great racing history and legend. So um, yeah. Uh, I think we may have touched on it um, just a few minutes ago, but John Tuckwell wants to know, out of everything that you've done in motorsport and that huge career of yours, what would you say is your one kind of defining big achievement? If you could only put one thing on a, on a plaque as you're going in to be a, a speaker somewhere, what would you put on it? Hmm. Um, obviously, Le Mans is up there. Um, I loved my time in sports cars. Um, that first day at Imola, driving a Grand Prix car um, as a Formula One driver, pretty cool, um, it was something special. Um, winning the World Championship in Superstocks at Wimbledon, because our family worked, you know, we're, we're so involved in, in, in Superstocks, in oval racing, um, that that was special. You know, everybody jokes about it, but I keep on telling people, Nigel Mansell only won one World Championship, I won two. So I'm just saying, I'm just yeah. saying, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, Fantastic. Um, it goes right yeah, back no, I think I think Lamore was special, World Championship was special. But um that first day you become a Grand Prix driver. Um there's nothing beats that, that's for sure. Yeah. No, and uh Imola as well. What a what a circuit to have your first Formula One race on. I know. So there was quite a few questions that were along the same lines about the Vauxhall years in BTCC saying effectively, if I can sort of sum summarize them all into one question, it is at that point. Were you just having fun? Because, I mean, one of them actually quoted in, in a, a message on, on Twitter to say, you were just smiling all the time, just like this was just great fun. You know, I have fun with everything I do. You know, I'm a fun guy. Um, I, I've always enjoyed being a racing driver. I enjoy being team boss. I enjoy being team manager. I enjoy every aspect of motor racing, whether it's training at, at, at night, in the wind, in the rain, 
uh, whether it's um, testing day after day after day. And, you know, with Peugeot, we, we, we would test until the bloody car broke. Um, I enjoyed the PR. I enjoyed talking to marshals, to sponsors. Um, I just love every aspect of being a racing driver. Um, and then to be able to uh, be lucky enough to get into some of the, the greatest race cars in the world that, that only a very few handful of people, it's a privilege, you know, it's an honor. It's something that, that I still love today. And, and that's why I'm still involved today because I want to stay um, involved in motor racing. I want to help young drivers. Um, I want to give back to the BIDC. You know, I wore the BIDC badge um, when I was in, in Formula One, you know, because that, it meant a lot to me. I, it just mean, it, it still does mean a lot to me. Um, and um, so I, I'm just a, I'm, I'm just an anorak really. You know, I, I just love watching all motorsport. I watch indie cars, NASCAR, um, motorbikes, MotoGP, uh, world, world, world superbikes. I just watch everything. I just absolutely love it. It puts a smile on my face. Brilliant. So one from me then, because you were uh, you took part in the first Masters Formula One uh, season, I think, didn't you? Yeah. The inaugural season. As a as a fan, I, that sort of changed what I was going to ask actually. But as a as an enthusiast and a an Nanarak, what was that like climbing back into cars, which you know. You raced these when you were actually racing in Formula One. Now you're jumping into a historic car. And did you have to put a sort of slap a grin on your face and pretend it was um, great fun? I, I didn't not. think, when he contacted me, I didn't think he put it together, not with the kind of drivers that was doing it. Um, and then I went to Silverstone um, for a test. Um, and I, I was excited to know whether this 50-odd-year-old guy still had the balls to take... I don't know, Abbey or club or whatever, flat. Um, and I have to say, um, I surprised myself. I was surprised myself that I just loved every single bit of it. It never frightened me. I still, I think I was braver um, back when I drove the Masters cars than what I was when I was a Grand Prix driver. Um, because I've never been, I've never, a uh, question's often asked. And I, I ask you this as well, Guy. Have you ever been frightened driving a race car? I don't believe I have. I've never been frightened, no. no, no, no but that's a, a question no. I often ask. No. Uh, I, I get asked, and uh, never. No. You know, I mean, no matter what happened, I've never been frightened. And you've got to remember, something like 13 drivers were killed, of which two or three of them, you know, Gilles Verneuve, he was in my arms um, when he had the accident at Zolda. So back in our day, we, we had to... We had to create um, something in our head that would absorb this without it affecting what we were doing. And I used to call it a safe. I used to have a safe in the back of my head. Um, and when a tragedy happened, no matter who it was, what it was, I would put that person in the safe um, and um, I'd go out there and, and do my job. The difficult one for me was Paul, my little brother, when, when, when he was killed. Was that at Alton Park, wasn't it? At Alton Park, yeah, um, former 3000. Um, that was tough. I mean, um, you know, when, when Paul was killed, for sure, um, uh, it was difficult to know whether or not you wanted to race. Um, and when I came back after, um, after the race um, to face your mother um, and father, um, is, it was pretty tough, you know, and I had to ask myself a lot of questions. And... The one thing I did was was promise my mum, um, my sisters and everybody that I wouldn't race again uh, because at the time uh, they needed it to get through the next few days. After we buried Paul, um, Tom, obviously I was racing for Tom at the time, um, and he asked quite rightly the question, are you carrying on or you're not? Um, and he ended up taking the car to the A1 ring, which is now the Red Bull ring, um, for a, t a secret test to see whether or not I wanted to drive or not. And it was tough. I went, I got there, I ran the first day. Um, we put some different dampers on at the end of the day. One of them broke or seized, I can't remember. And I spun into the Bosch curve, not, not damaging the car. I got out of the car, went back to the hotel and just cried. I just cried until four or five o'clock in the morning until as such, there was nothing left. There was absolutely nothing left. And I remember, 
looking in the mirror and saying, right, okay, he either goes into the safe um, and you carry on racing or stop now. And they were the, they were the two choices. And um, I went out the next day, uh, broke our lap record um, around uh, the A1 ring. And, um, and I then from that day on, I used to put Paul in the safe on a Thursday morning. Um, and I promise you, I could not, I would not see him. I wouldn't even be able to recognize a picture of him until Sunday night. And then Sunday night, um, he'd come out and the emotion and would flood back and I cry because I'm, I'm a very emotional guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, that was tough, you know, and, and when people like Villeneuve and that, um, die in a race car, you realize that it can happen to you. Absolutely. Um, you obviously think it never will otherwise you wouldn't get into a car um but um yeah no it was um it was there were a few tough years that's for sure yeah well he came out he came out of it you know the other side of it and yeah i mean you know really appreciate you sharing that with us um you know it must have been yeah. incredibly incredibly tough um well, thank so, you for for those who sent the questions in. The questions get more and more each week. We at the beginning we thought we had three or four, Derek, that we used to sort of have scribbled on a, a bit of note, but now we have to actually sift through them and um, and come up with some to ask because we have that many, especially with names like yourself coming on the podcast. Thank, so, you. thank you. So I've got some quick fire questions, um, Derek. So they're just just random no, ones. No, you're not going to embarrass me, are you? I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to embarrass you. Um, so you just got to say the first one that comes into your mind, really. So. Uh, Top Gear or Grand Tour? Uh, top Gear. Um, Le Mans or Monaco? Oh my goodness, Monaco! <laughs> that was that was tough. <laughs> Beach holiday or adventure holiday? Beach. Dogs or cats? Dog. Oversteer or understeer? <sighs> understeer. Why? Uh, got... Why? I need to know why. Um. I've always been an understeer driver, a bit like Jensen Button. I think, you know, I like to feel comfortable in the car. Um, I, I know the best way is uh, the, with the rear moving all the time. Schumacher proved that um, a few times, um, but it wasn't the way I drove. I, I drove differently. I think maybe it was from, from the short oval days. I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, I was definitely an understeer driver. Okay. Now I've got here, I've got Peugeot, Peugeot 905 or the Arrows A11. Why? I don't know. Because why, I'm, not, I, why not the Jaguar XJR14? I don't know. I, Paul, Paul, maybe. Well, I guess I chose the Peugeot because you won in it. Hang so are you just going to throw me under the bus there? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I thought the Peugeot, you won in the Peugeot. So I thought maybe that would be more. The 89, the 89 Arrows was just amazing. Was it? And in, in, in or how many times um, I drove sports cars, Getting back into a Grand Prix car was twice as difficult. Was it really? It's just more demanding, more difficult, faster. Everything, the pace of uh, the journalists, the 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 team, everything is just a different pace. It's just yeah. um, no, definitely Formula One. Right. Okay. Uh, V6 or V8? V8. And then we've got a pass along question from Mr. John Cleland. Oh, no. <laughs> he was our last guest. If only he'd known, <laughs> it could have been even more fun. And he said, which kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, what's the most scary thing that has ever happened to you in a car? And that could be in a road car, race car, or any car. We should explain the context because he, he drove the babysitter home one night in his work, his works, his company, um, Cavalier no, GSI. And over. And he yeah. turned it over, yeah, in, in the with the with the babysitter in. Yeah, but I wonder whether he did. I wonder whether he made that story up and <laughs> had a long time with a babysitter doing something else. Just saying, Just saying. Well, <laughs> could, could well be. Could well be. Um, I bet I mean, the bit it, about her dad coming to the window was correct, though. <laughs> I mean, the best one was Jason Plato said to me. He said, "What was the what? This was for the next guest." He said, "What was describe your first bit of action you ever had in the back seat of a car?" And the next guest was Brian Gushy, who was my previous boss at Bent, my boss at Bentley. So luckily, it was his wife, so it was all right. <laughs> yeah. but, so he said, uh, "Yeah, so he said." So, um, so Which Derek also, Josh, just for Derek's um, benefit and anyone who's just tuning in, we always chuckle when people say when racing drivers say dogs rather than cats, but that's a theme that we've seen all the yeah. way through, isn't it? Engineers like cats and racing drivers on, like hang dogs. On, hang on, us racing drivers have, uh, have known a few dogs in our time <laughs> that's true yeah, it's true i thought you were going to whack circle about loyalty and uh, uh, a wagging yeah. tail at the door no, but never mind no no no, no. So, so what what do you think then most scary thing that's ever happened in a car oh, you, i'm just 
I my very first car uh, was when I was 16 was a Robin Reliant three wheeler, right? <laughs> Dow, Dow Boy special. Dow Boy. Um, we had that thing on its doorstops <laughs> everywhere. Um, and that used to frighten me. It really did. Now, I, in a race car, like I said, I've never been frightened. You know, you know, after an accident, after a death, before a death. Um, I think the bravest thing I ever did, which is a better way of, of, of answering this question, um, was uh, 1990 Jerez after Martin Donnelly had that big accident. Um, we all knew the car was, was, was a bit dodgy. Um, it's it in the Lotus, wasn't it? The Lotus Lamborghini. It kept on braking. And that's what happened to Martin. He had a, um, a front suspension failure. Um, I decided that night um, that I wasn't going to race. The car was too dangerous. Um, my guys worked all night. I, I didn't know it at the time. So I came in to say to the team, sorry, guys, but, you know, this is a step too far. I'm not going to run it anymore. Um, and I realized that the guys had worked all night and made this special titanium bit that strengthened this, uh, the front of the, the chassis that kept breaking. And um, so I ushered everybody out the, out the garage, um, except my three mechanics and my engineer. And I said, right, guys, is this good enough for me to race? Is this safe enough for me to race? And because you trust your mechanics, you really do. And they said, yes, this bit, he said, they both said, um, I don't know if something else might break, but this bit won't break. <laughs> and through that fast right-hander at the back of um, Jerez, um, my, my first flying lap, I was flat. And I still think today that was the bravest thing I ever did. Mm. And I remember when I came back in, we qualified um, ninth or 10th, I can't remember. Um, when I came back in, I had a standing ovation from... Um, everybody at the garage so wow. that was pretty special that was a wow. special moment brilliant good great answer so um Derek do you have a question for our next guest we're not sure who it's going to be yet but it will be some racing person <laughs> some dog lover day <laughs> if, if it is a, a racing driver um it'd be interesting to ask the person what do they know today that would have benefited them um back when they were actually started racing because I, I i look back now with the experience i have and i'd love to be racing former ford today mm. um, because there's so many things that i know now um, that i didn't know at the time that would have made me even a greater driver um and i think that everybody has to has to admit that something they they know today that would have helped them so much um back in the day brilliant great question Brilliant. And we will, of course, keep you updated if you're listening to this, who our next guest will be on our social media. So make sure you follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can watch the shows on YouTube as well as listening to them if indeed that's what you're doing now. And, uh, and Guy always wants me to mention, and I always forget to, that you should leave us a five. Is it a five star review, Guy? Well, ideally five star. Yeah, yeah I mean, ideally five. Listen, we're completely rubbish. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a, I think that was a five star show. It deserves a five star review. Thank you. Derek for sharing those stories and uh, another human account, which um, Thank is, you, Paul. It was, is, is a pleasure doing it. And Guy, um, I'm terribly jealous that you're going to Sebring. Um, <laughs> so um, can you win there? I, I'll definitely have a try. Yeah. I, I, okay. I remember what to do. Absolutely. Right. Good luck, mate. It's uh, nice meeting you or speaking to you. Yeah. Um, and well, then I, so we can catch up sometime. Let's hopefully catch up at the BRDC for some beers soon. Okay. I look forward to it.